so just wanted to let everyone know that we're we're going to record this um, just again for our own record keeping purposes and to show that we did this deliverable. Um, and we may upload it to our YouTube page uh, just for promotional purposes. So if anyone is in the audience is not okay with being recorded, um, you can leave. <laughs> um, so, all right. So basically a little brief history of why we're doing this. Uh, of course, the Contestor Main Museum is a longstanding heritage institution in Harbor Grace. We've got a 50 year track record of showcasing significant stories. Uh, from our community and from the Conception Bay region. Um, one of Conception Bay's most significant stories is, of course, Harbor Grace's aviation legacy. Uh, we've showcased this through physical exhibits, including our recent upgrading of Bill Parsons' aviation room on the second floor of the museum. And we're all, of course, we're always looking for new and creative ways to tell the museum's stories, particularly in the virtual realm. Over the last five years, we've upgraded our physical inventory digitally through Past Perfect, uh, designed a new website with useful resources, expanded our social media presence, created the YouTube page, and developed a digital database of Harbor Grace and Bristol's Hopes and Bristol's Hopes uh, World War One and World War Two volunteers. Um, so again, uh, Digital Museums Canada. A little bit of our background here. Uh, for years, the museum has eyed the Digital Museum Canada Community Stories Program, formerly known as Virtual Museum of Canada, as a great opportunity to highlight a story from the region and expand the museum's profile nationally. So this is a pretty well-known uh, program. Uh, again, we've been looking and discussing this for years. I'm sure Danita would tell you, we've been talking about this for ages, in past as well. Um, so with the aforementioned upgrading of the aviation room, the museum believed a virtual exhibit would be an excellent complement to this physical exhibit. Uh, both have, of course, their limitations, but when paired together, we thought we could do justice to the full story of Harbor Grace's aviation legacy. So I'll talk a little bit about that um, further on here. So again, the question is maybe by some of the audience, what's Digital Museums Canada? So Digital Museums Canada is a funding program in Canada dedicated to, let me move my screen here so I can read this, to online projects by museum and heritage communities, helping organizations to build digital capacity. Administered by the Canadian Museum of Hi History, with financial support of the Government of Canada, DMC provides investments of $15,000 to $250,000 for audience engaging online projects by Canadian museums and heritage organizations. At $2 million in funding, DMC is the largest funding program of its kind in Canada, and it has a very good reputation. Uh, as of 2021, Digital Museums Canada took, took the place of Virtual Museum of Canada, a national virtual museum. So they, they went through a little rebrand recently, uh, but effectively the program broadly remains the same as it was in the DMC format. Um, so our upcoming work with Digital Museums Canada all right, so an applicant under the small investment stream, the Conception Bay Museum was awarded along with 12 others, $15,000 in funding to create a virtual exhibit based on Harbor Grace's aviation history. Our virtual exhibit is tentatively, tentatively titled Alone Among the Stars, Aviation, Harbor Grace, 1919 to Present. Uh, from our submitted press release, okay, this is just a little blurb about it. Um, on August 26, 1927, the pride of Detroit landed at the Harbor Grace airstrip to a welcoming crowd. Local townspeople constructed the airstrip in a mere 20 days, specifically for the plane's landing. And over the coming decades, Harbor Grace would cement its legacy in aviation lore, hosting 20 transatlantic flight attempts. This virtual exhibit tells the story of aviation in this area through archival records, oral histories, and artifacts. Anyone wondering about the title piece when we submitted that proposal um, comes from a quote from Amelia Earhart talking about her flight from Harbor Grace. So she was alone among the stars. And um, I guess uh, I guess I can speak in my own individual capacity, but that one was I kind of came up with it in some way. Uh, I what I kind of liked about that title was, of course, it's a quote from Earhart. Um, um, and it's also kind of speaks to Harbor Grace's uniqueness, being alone in some sort of way um, at the forefront, of course, at the, of the aviation story. And the Among the Stars piece, there's kind of two meanings to the stars, of course, the physical stars in the, in the atmosphere, but also the celebrities and people like that who came to, uh, to the town. So I thought the name was kind of cool. 
Again, that may change at some point in time, but that was, we had to come up with a title and that was a title for the proposal. Um, so where does the funding go? Uh, so DMC's $15,000 in funding is to facilitate the creation of a virtual exhibit hosted on the DMC online platform, digitalmuseumscanada.ca. Eligible expenses related to this funding include, these are just some examples, cost of French translation. So one big thing for DMC, and I guess why it has such a great nationwide reputation is that all writing, closed captioning, subtitles, et cetera, must be in both official languages. And the cost of a French translator is pretty significant. Oftentimes it's about 50% 50, 50 of the entire funding kind of has to go to hire a translator, give or take, um, in terms of when you actually go into the budget and stuff like that and, and price people. Um, cost of hiring a research and writer, of course, this is a salary expense for the project lead who will work for the museum to develop the virtual exhibit. Um, cost of technology and programs, example, Microsoft Office, computer equipment, videography equipment, etc. These would all be eligible expenses and required to deliver the project. Uh, one good thing about our museum is that we kind of have a, a leg up in some ways on other places because we've um, we've acquired a lot of these, this equipment through um, different projects of the years and stuff. Um, and of course, obviously significant volunteer and in-kind support are required to bring this project to fruition as well. Of course, this is why we have staff person like Danita here. And of course we have a volunteer like Christina here um, who both bring a lot of um, experience in their own uh, skill sets to the fore here. And um, so yeah, of course, with any nonprofit, you're gonna, you're gonna require volunteer and in-kind support in some way to make a project a success. All right, so <clears throat> I guess we're getting now to the narrative piece of the uh, of the project we're looking to do here. Um, so I encourage anyone here on the webinar, if they're particularly interested in the project, to go on Digital Museum Canada's website and just see some of the actual funded projects they've done on the stream. And that kind of shows you the template of how uh, these things work. It's almost like flipping through a book um, in some sort of way. And that's why uh, everything is designed as a chapter. So usually each chapter is roughly from probably around a maximum of 500 words and may include um, various, again, uh, items in some sort of way. I use items in, in the broadest sense uh, to kind of tell the story, i.e. photographs, uh, videos, oral histories, archival records, um, physical artifacts in some sort of way. Um, so these sorts of things also tell the story in some in, in a virtual format um, to the people who can't maybe physically visit your museum or showcase items that might not actually be physically on display in your museum but are part of the collection. So, um, so the proposed chapters we have here, uh, I'll just go through them briefly. Number one is beginnings. Number two, or beginnings, Great Atlantic Air Race, Hanley Page Atlantic. I'll give a bit of detail on these in a second. Uh, number two, constructing the airship prior to Detroit, 1927. Uh, three, early disasters, two early disasters that happened, uh, Sir John Carling in the Old Glory and rescued by the SS Kyle. Uh, chapter four, Columbia and Harbor Grace, uh, the story around Mabel Ball and uh, the second part there, Earl Boyd and Harry Connor. Those two were the first two Canadians to fly, fly across the Atlantic, um, 1930, from Harbor Grace. Um, Number five is Crash of the City of New York and Finding Tailwind the Dog. Um, that one might be a... Ooh, am I muted? Oh, God. How much did you hear that? Did I mute myself with the... Did any of that? When did I cut off there? We only lost a couple of seconds. I don't know how that happened. Okay, interesting. Because I didn't even yeah, touch my just kind of <laughs> I didn't even touch my yeah, head. It's kind of wind for a second, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, so Crash of the City of New York. Um, this one might be expanded a little bit because it encompassed maybe several of the crashes that happened in the airship. There were, I think, um, I want to say there were two to three crashes, I believe, of the airship um, itself. Uh, number six, Amelia Earhart and Lockheed Vega, of course, the most famous story associated with our airstrip here in Harbor Grace. Um, maybe one of Newfoundland's, in my opinion, one of Newfoundland's great stories. Um, Seven, Rescue of the Lady Peace, um, Eddie Rickenbacker, that story there. Uh, number eight would be focused on the Harbor Race Airport Trust Company logbook, again, a physical kind of object that helps tell the story of, of the uh, 
of the airstrip in some way, like a primary document. Um, number nine, Ruben Parsons, he was kind of the photographer of the airstrip. That's why we have such a great photographic tranche of, of documents, is thanks to Ruben and his and his son Bill, um, who, who took a lot of those pictures. Um, Tim, the Archwell family and their maintenance of the airstrip. Um, Harry Archibald was the chair of the Harbor Grace Airport Trust Company. And uh, I think we could tell a really good story there about the Archibald family. Um, number 11, Miss Dorothy. This is the last uh, plane that left on a solo transatlantic flight from the airstrip in 1936 and kind of marks the end of the era in some, in some ways of, of this kind of daredevil beat. 12 is leased to the Royal Canadian Navy. This is kind of a uh, lesser known story about the airstrip, but um, when World War II, uh, broke out um, in 1939. Um, the Royal Canadian Navy actually leased uh, the airstrip off the <clears throat> off the, uh, the airport trust company and set up a high frequency direction finding site there. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, number 13 is Lamont Parsons, probably Harbor Grace's most famous uh, wartime aviator. I would say most certainly he is. Um, 14, of course, is the airship today, the contemporary story of our airship. How is it utilized today? Who are the people who got it to where it is today? in some way, um, and maybe why you should still come and visit it. Uh, and 15 is the Aviation Room, the Conception Bay Museum. I discussed that in an earlier slide, but the um, kind of the story about how we came to upgrade this room, maybe the history of the, of the, of the, of the room from when Bill Parsons first constructed it to uh, the, work of, um, the work of our current board of directors to revamp and modernize that room for the 21st century viewer. All right, so I'll give a little bit more detail on the air race for a second. Of course, Great Atlantic Air Race. Uh, this kind of marks the beginning of Harbor Race's aviation story. Um, this, I guess, is a bit, didn't technically happen at our airstrip now. Uh, it happened at, I guess, what you could call maybe the first airstrip in Harbor Race, which was just a field behind the Immaculate, Immaculate Conception Church. Um, and they, assembled this plane in 105 crates. It was an old World War I plane, and uh, it was going to fly across the Atlantic to win a prize from the Daily Mail. A um, little bit more uh, details on that. It actually didn't attempt the flight. It was beaten to takeoff uh, by Alcock and Brown, and of course, they walked away with the Daily Mail prize and uh, have all the fame and fortune associated with that. And uh, this plane didn't uh, didn't go. However, it's a fascinating story here in Harbor Reese, I think. And a lot of the things about, you know, how it was a converted farmer's field, how people had to move houses and things like that. This is quite an interesting story, I think. Uh, number two is constructing the airstrip 1927. Uh, of course, the airship was first constructed in August of 1926 to facilitate the landing of Waco Oil's promotional flight, the Pride of Detroit. This kind of marks the, the, the start of, of the Harbor Grace Airstrip as we know it today. Um, and this was a success, successful flight. Um, number three, early disasters. Um, of course, what I guess we would like to highlight in this piece is how this was a very dangerous feat. And uh, there were plenty of people who didn't make it, quote unquote. Um, and one of them happened, one of these disasters happened very soon after the airship was put there. Um, so this is the Sir John Carling. Uh, this is the first airship's first recorded disaster, uh, where Jerry Tully and John Metcalf, two Canadians from Ontario, uh, came here to Harbor Grace to challenge the Atlantic, and they ended up going missing. And um, no one heard from them since. Um, and then, though the Old Glory, this is that again, the Old Glory was another disaster um, of 1927. It didn't leave Harbor Grace. Um, but it was recovered by the SS Kyle, of course, the shipwreck here in our harbor. Um, so I thought that might be an interesting story to kind of tell and how the, even though the old glory didn't leave from Harbor Grace, uh, it did influence uh, another flight that was here at the time. The Royal Windsor was supposed to do a transatlantic or have a transatlantic flight, um, but it ended up canceling the flight because of the, of the crash of the old glory and the recovery by the SS Kyle because Basically, there was almost a, uh, a hiatus in the sort of stuff because it was so so dangerous there for, for a few months. Um, number four is the Columbian Harbor Race, 1928-1930. Don't think Lisa Daly is with us here today, but uh, Lisa is certainly, I would say, the expert on this topic for, from a museum perspective. Um, 
So uh, the airplane Columbia actually came to Harbor Grace twice. Um, both flights are significant. Um, in 1928, it came carrying Mabel Ball. Uh, Mabel Ball was uh, attempted to be the first female to cross the Atlantic Ocean um, as a passenger, not as a, as a pilot in any capacity, but just simply as a passenger. Um, however, she was beaten to this feat by Amelia Earhart. Uh, Earhart, again, 1928, she was in Trapassi and she flew across the Atlantic as a passenger and got all the fame and fortune. Kind of That was when Earhart kind of first made her mark. Of course, we'll return to Earhart in, in four years from now. Um, and then the second flight of the Columbia was carrying Canadians Earl Boyd and Harry Connor. Um, they came to Harbor Grace 1930 and flew the Columbia across the Atlantic and they became the first two uh, Canadians to actually um, have a nonstop flight from, from North America to, uh, to Western Europe. And of course, they a lot of fame and fortune associated with, with their accomplishment too. And that's, a, a kind of, in my opinion, the Boyd and Connor story is kind of, not too many people know about it, then, but it's again, it's a, it's a great national story in some sort of way. So let me showcase that one. Oh, I had a picture there of Mabel Ball um, at Harbor Grace uh, with pilot Oliver Laboutier. Um, here we have a picture of the Columbia on its second flight to Harbor Grace in 1930. This is from the logbook, which I'll mention in a bit. Really like that photo. And I guess when we're kind of going through this little webinar here, I just want to bring it, bring um, everyone to kind of highlight the, the really cool photographs I think we have here. And um, of course, these will be. Uh, be hosted by the virtual exhibit in some sort of way. So, I mean, we got some really fascinating photos here. This, this slide shows simply just a snapshot, but uh, I love this photo here, it's great. Um, crash of the city of New York. Um, again, this was maybe the most well-known crash uh, at the airship. Uh, so John Henry Mears in the city of New York arrived in Harbor Grace in 1930. Uh, Mears' plane crashed on takeoff uh, with his flight mascot, the dog Tailwind, which was gifted to him by actress Mary Pickford. Uh, running off into the woods. So distraught, Mears offered a substantial reward for the missing dog's return. And he was, the dog was later recovered to the pilot's delight. So that's a kind of a little fun story we want to tell. And possibly we might expand this story to include um, other crashes that happened in the airship. There was definitely another one, uh, the crash of the Warsaw. And uh, I think there was a more contemporary crash. I'm not sure the name of that flight now. So that's how I think. Uh, course number six, Amelia Earhart and Lockheed Vega. Not much need to be said about this one uh, from my perspective yet. Um, you know, Amelia Earhart, of course, famously left Harbor Grace Airstrip on May 20th, 1932, becoming the first female to fly solo nonstop across the Atlantic. At that time, an unparalleled feat, which made her an international feminist icon for generations. And of course, so many people visit our community just to see the Amelia Earhart statue. And, and of course, this is the, this is the, the, the jewel in the crown, I think, of, of the story here. Uh, number seven is the rescue of the Lady Peace. This is in 1936. Um, maybe a little bit of a lesser known flight, but certainly interesting. Um, the rescue of American World War I flying ace Eddie Rickenbacker and his Lady Peace uh, brought much attention to the airship with several international press planes arriving at the airship to cover the event. You can see from the picture here is just there were so many people here to cover this event because Eddie Rickenbacker was quite a quite an American celebrity, and uh, and the rescue attempt uh, came through came through Harbor Grace. Number eight is the Harbor Grace Air Airport Trust, sorry Airship Trust Company uh, logbook. Um, so the trust company logbook was, or the trust company itself was an arm's length committee which managed operations of the airship for the town. Um, the logbook, fully digitized in the museum's online collection records many significant flight details and contains original signatures, and in the case of Boyd and Connor, diaristic accounts of visiting aviators. So you can see the picture here. This is actually kind of like a, a diary entry from, uh, from Earl Boyd, which tells like three pages of all these really interesting details about the flight and how they spent the night in PEI and how the, how the girls in PEI were very beautiful, they said, and a few other things. So. It's a kind of a, a neat little piece of the logbook. A lot of really cool pictures in it and things like that. And a lot, and a lot of really good details, like the specific times uh, down to the minute of when these people left and what the conditions were, the direction of the wind, speed of the wind, things like that. So pretty neat artifact in my opinion. Um, number nine, Ruben T. Parsons. As I said earlier, much of our photographic record of the airship is thanks to Ruben. 
and his son Bill is pictured here. Um, Bill actually worked um, as a stringer for the Associated Press at the time, so he would actually um, kind of cover these uh, meat and bones details of the flights and send it along to AP, um, who would then publish um, kind of a press release based around the uh, based around the event itself. So it'd be nice to tell, kind of focus on that photographic record because it's so expansive. I think. Um, number 10 is the Archibald family and their maintenance of the airship. I actually have a really good picture of Harry Archibald here, but I, I couldn't find it in time for the webinar, unfortunately. But the, um, so yeah, the Archibald family, of course, Harry Archibald, chair of the airport trust company, significant figure related to the airship's creation, maintenance, promotion, and legacy. I want to tell a bit of their connection to the, uh, to the airship. They're certainly a, a big part of it. Number 11, the Miss Dorothy. Um, Miss Dorothy was Harbor Grace's last transatlantic flight, marking the end of an era for this daredevil act. And of course, why, some people might ask. Um, through the research process, we might come to some conclusions about why sort of the this suddenly kind of stopped in 1936. Uh, from what I little I've read, it seems like the technology was improving and just, you know, these daredevil feats weren't particularly impressive anymore with technology advancing. And of course, the geopolitical situation in Europe at the time, people kind of knew there was, you know, um, possibly a war ahead. Um, and, you know, it signaled a dark decade, and this sort of stuff wasn't really headline news at that point in time. So, Miss Dorothy was the last flight. And this is the picture of the pilot there. I quite like that picture, actually. Um, number 12, leased to the Royal Canadian Navy. So, during World War II, Royal Canadian Navy leased the underutilized airstrip to create a high frequency direction finding site. So what's that, you might ask. Uh, so the site um, was essentially a rough shack housed by radio operators who attempted to intercept coded messages between Nazi U-boats off the coast of Newfoundland. So this is kind of a code breaking kind of a, a site, which is a pretty interesting history. And um, I would say not particularly well known, um, but um, maybe adjacent to the airstrip story, but kind of, uh, you know, kind of interesting in its, in its uniqueness too, in some ways. So I think the virtual exhibit, uh, should, is a great medium to tell this story that we probably couldn't tell in the actual physical exhibit when we did, uh, last spring. The 13 is Lamont Parsons. So very well-known aviator, Harbor Grace's flying ace. Um, Lamont here was a relative of Reuben and Bill, who I just mentioned, um, he signed up for the RCAF and later the RAF and fought in the Battle of Britain. Uh, so his daredevil feats of, or his daredevil feat of flying between the two spires of the Immaculate Conception Cathedral is a story we still talk about in Harbor Grace today. Of course, it was uh, made into a well-known painting by Ian Sparks and uh, a lot of folklore kind of associated with this one. And I think it's, you know, it's a good good chance to tell that, that kind of fun story there with Lamont Parsons and certainly the most, uh, famous World War II aviator, you know, undoubtedly a hero from, from our town, uh, fighting in the Battle of Britain, of course, which was, a, you know, one of the, one of the war's pivotal battles. Um, 14, of course, is the airship today. Uh, so the legacy of the airship maintenance is thanks to, a lot of it anyway, is, is thanks to Claude Stevenson, who landscaped and mowed the grass for decades. Uh, Stevenson learned to fly in mainland Canada and returned home to Harbor Grace on his own personal plane. Uh, so his hangar still remains there as a monument to this story uh, today. And Copa Flight 97 continue uh, Claude's legacy and, and showcase what amateur aviation is all about. So uh, yeah, the virtual exhibit is, is a good opportunity, I think, to kind of showcase those uh, some of those contemporary stories and what we're doing today sort of thing. And um, I'm sure we can do some really good video content, I think, for this one through interviews and things of that nature, um, because Copa is certainly uh, a very enthusiastic supporter of, of, of the Harbor Grace airstrip. And of course, picture here of uh, Claude Stevenson. He's in his plane. I really like that picture. He just looks so so happy. I think in that picture. Um, and he certainly loved. He certainly loved that airstrip. Um, and number fifteen is new aviation room. So the aforementioned Bill Parsons was behind the first iteration of the museum's aviation room. And our newly revamped room opened last year on May twentieth, uh, twenty twenty two, ninetieth anniversary of Earhart's transatlantic flight. 
and is a tribute to Bill's original work and showcases a thematic retelling of the Harbor Race Airstrip. Um, of course, the Airport Trust uh, Company logbook is on display in a glass case and several of these um, some of these little uh, models by David Williams. Basically, David Williams, uh, for those who don't know on the webinar, he um, was a great airplane modeler, for, for want of a better word, and he handcrafted models for every single air, uh, plane that was at the Air Harbor Grace Airship, including Claude's plane and different pilot planes, things like that. It's, it's a story that is truly fascinating. Um, and a point I, I wanted to bring up that I, I mentioned earlier was um, I'll just make it now before uh, before we, we we wrap up and go to the question period is um, the aviation room when we kind of in, um, thought about how to implement that and what kind of story we tell I remember we had a little brainstorming session and I think first off we wanted to do kind of more of a chronological retelling but then we as you can see when we go through this thing and this is only a snapshot of it. Um, you would never have enough space to do a proper chronological retelling of, of Harbor Grace's aviation story. Um, so we kind of went down a thematic route and or like a blend route, I guess. So it's, you know, you can see the uh, you can see the years here on, on the walls and things. So it does chronologically link in some sort of way. Um, but it's more of a thematic retelling, i.e. here's the beginning. Here's the story of female aviators. Here's the story of Canadian aviators. Here's the story of crashes. Here's the story of um, our flying aces. But I think um, what I really like about this, and I think what the museum really likes about it, is the virtual museum format is can is going to pair with the actual physical exhibit, but maybe expand on the chronological piece that we couldn't do so much. So we're going to use this opportunity to kind of flesh out a few more details that we couldn't tell um, based on spatial limitations in the physical exhibit. Um, and we'll use the virtual platform to do it. So showcase some artifacts that, again, aren't on display when you go and visit the Concession Bay Museum. You might not see, say, the lease document from the Royal Canadian Navy um, and the Airport Trust Company. However, you'd see it in the virtual exhibit. And I think it's really a cool way for us to say people who visit the virtual exhibit will know the physical exhibits there. People who visit the physical exhibit will know the virtual exhibits there. So it's, I think it's going to be as, um, as expansive a telling of this story as we can through an exhibit format outside of reading the book. So um, I'm excited. I think Christine is excited. I think Danita is excited-ish, I think, Danita. And uh, yeah, so I guess we'll go to the feedback period. I'll stop the share here. Um, so we have this set up as a... Uh, in a webinar format, so we got three people, I'm sorry, six people here on the call. Um, if you do want to talk, guys, uh, there should be a feature there in the in uh, on your toolbar, right at the bottom, it says raise hand. And when you press that, you will see your hand raise and then I can either allow you to speak or uh, enable you to use the chat bar, I believe. Um, so, and if someone writes a question in the chat, I can read it out and I can just give the response. So um, we'll give it a couple minutes there, I'm sure. If someone wants to talk or you don't have to give ask a question, you can just make a comment. Oh, we got Patrick Collins here wanting to talk. So I'll allow Patrick to talk again. He likes that. Denise and Christine, you guys can mute yourselves now if you want. So you can speak a little bit here. Okay, how's that? You got me? Yeah, we got you, brother. How are you? Uh, pretty good, pretty good. Um, just uh, first of all, thank you very much to uh, yourself and Danita and Christina for, for taking this on. Uh, really pleased. Uh, that I, obviously, a lot of progress gone into this, and, and uh, I can see that uh, it's a lot of work. So, so just to say thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, not surprised to see that things are rolling along so well. I have to say, I love the format. Um, I really do. I think the way you, you guys got it laid out. Um, it's going to be a nice, easy read, you know, as, as you were, as you were doing it, I was trying to project the thinking and saying, my God, what a time to actually transplant this now to a book, not my book, of course, but, you know, museums. So to roll this out in the form of a book would be really good because I think it's made for, uh, to go in print as well. That's a different, that's a topic for a different time. Well, I got to say, I, I, I really think it's great. Now I got one question. Uh, during the actual uh, the actual process itself, 
is there any voiceover? Is there narration? Uh, you know, that kind of thing, either sounds. I, I, I'm just wondering, how, how does that fit in, Matthew? Uh, I'll, I'll give my answer and then Christina and Danita can jump in too. Um, yeah, so it's a multimedia perspective. It's not limited to simply photos. It's not limited to simply, uh, here's a picture of, a, of a, an artifact like a log book or something. Um, so things are, um, so there's the ability to say, have an MP3 interview with somebody. There's an ability to have an MP4 video format. We'd use YouTube to do this. Um, so it's, it's a fully multimedia perspective. It's not simply, it's not static in any way. So um, we've, I guess, got a broad outline, I think, or in our heads about what kind of interviews and who we'd like to interview. For instance, I could see us like, um, like I could see us interviewing someone like Heather Stemp, for instance, Patrick, about Archibald family, right? I could see us interviewing Lisa Daly about Columbia or another story about it. Uh, I could see us interviewing yourself. I could see us interviewing, um, Brian Hood with Copa, I could, you know what I mean? So there's different pieces like that. Um, so it, it, it's basically where we want to kind of focus our energy in some ways and who would have probably the most interesting stories to tell about it in, in a way. Um, like for instance, Bill Parsons, we might interview someone like Bill Bowman, who of course worked on the book with Bill Parsons. Um, so yeah, again, it's to, basically where you want to channel. That's, yeah, just to, that's what okay. you're asking. You just a follow-up question, Matthew, and then I'll go yep. away. Um, so I'm trying to imagine. So you so I hook on, I, I fire up my computer, mm -hmm. I go to that site, right? Yep. I go into the virtual museum, uh -huh. I go to our state, one better better word into our chapter, yep. and it opens up. And then there would be a narrator and some music, that kind of thing. I mean, I look for the whole thing, but I'm trying to picture. So will it be a story told over that period of time by it's, somebody? It still requires someone to read it. Um, okay. Now there, there may be uh, some features when it comes to say, uh, maybe Christina, you know a bit more about what the actual term would be, but like in terms of closed captioning, if someone actually read it out to you. Accessibility, Matthew, is what you're looking for. Pardon me? Accessibility? Yeah, the accessibility feature. So yeah, like, that all that, that has to be included. Yeah, so there you go. And, um, and of course, French and English. So that's yeah, so Pat, Pat, what that means is that when, as people navigate through, if you turn on closed caption, like you can for, you'll be able to read it, obviously. And then also, uh, like I said, uh, you had to make sure we have to build in certain features to make sure from the, an ability perspective that it's appealing to a vast array of audience. Yeah, and um, it also has the, um, the screen reading ability, if, if that's the right word, Christina, in some ways, of course, like um, Pat, like say if it's a picture of Claude Stevenson in his plane, I mean, I can look at it see, and see Claude Stevenson in his plane looking happy, as I just said, but some people might have a difficulty interpreting that in some sort of way. So you'd have to put like a, in the metadata, say Claude Stevenson in his red plane, appearing happy, you know, so stuff like that gotta be there and things like that. So it's, it's fully accessible. And uh, hopefully, as interactive as, as the as, as the platform realistically can be. Okay, th thank you very much. No sweat, sir. All right, we got Craig Westcott. So, oh, a lot of talk. Here we go. All right, Craig, you can speak here now, my friend. He's muted, Matthew. He's muted? I don't know if he's got himself muted or... Okay, he's there we go. Okay, Craig. Hello, Craig. Can you hear us? Maybe he can type in the chat, Matthew, if he's having problems with his audio. Yeah. Okay, I'll just say hi, Craig. Issues. I'll let Craig also type his, type his question here. And then I'll read it out. <clears throat> okay, the Brenda Hunt Stevenson here. <clears throat> 
So I will allow Brenda to share, or allowed to talk, I guess. No, I don't want to promote her to panelist. Christina, I should have had you uh, moderate this, I feel like. I feel like you're the one who, uh, who would. Uh... Okay, I'm gonna have to promote Christina to, uh, Brenda to panelist for a second here. It seems like, cause she's using an older version of Zoom. So Brenda, can you, uh, can you hear us there? Okay, I got Craig's question here too, guys. So I'll, we can see Brenda, you're muted, Brenda, but we can also see you, Brenda. So if you are mute, we should be able to hear you. There, that better. Go ahead. Okay, first of all, great job. I'm really impressed. I learned a lot here tonight, um, and I reiterate what Pat said. I mean, the work that's gone into it so far. I'm really impressed. Um, is there a timeline? Like, do we have months or is a year project like how long is this going to take before it's completed it's flexible is the short answer it's <clears throat> flexible i think it i think the maximum it has to be done is within two years um we're hoping to have this wrapped up by december 2023 so that would be kind of the launch um or that would be the kind of deliverable completion date am i saying that wrong Dean? i feel like that's correct right that is correct sir correct okay and uh It'd be nice for us to get all that done. I mean, maybe we'll launch it on another anniversary of some sort, Brenda, have it all done and launch it then. But um, yeah. what we're set for is to have it done for December of 2023. Yeah, it would be nice to incorporate it into something else. That's it. I, and Pat asked the other questions that I would have, like, how is it going to work? Not being computer savvy myself, you know, it's uh, nice mm -hmm. to know that Pat those questions. So, Again, thumbs up. Great job. I'm really impressed. And like I said, I learned a lot tonight. So thanks a lot. Yeah. And it's, um, Listen, it's anything, uh, I can do, anything I can do to help you out. If you want me to, I don't know, get your coffee while you're working. On <laughs> uh, Matthew, uh, I don't know if uh, you have a link that you can share with the people participants that they can go in and look at other samples of what yeah. has already been done. So that way that. they can get a little bit more of appreciation yeah. of that. Show. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I can definitely Perfect. click something like that in the uh, in the chat room here, maybe if I can figure it out. Um, I can figure it out. I can do that, or I think I might have everyone's email here anyway. I can just send something out. Um, but if, if if that doesn't happen, just Google uh, Digital Museums Canada Community Stories or something along those lines, and then you'll be able to um, read read some of them. Uh, some recent examples, just from the Newfoundland perspective, I know uh, I know Dale Jarvis and Heritage NL worked with, uh, I think they worked with Bay Roberts recently uh, on one of these projects uh, within the last three years, um, I think, or maybe the Bay Roberts, like, I know there's two different ones up there, but one of their foundations up there um, on one. And um, also, I believe the Wooden Boat Museum was funded for one recently. I don't think that one's been published yet, but I know they were funded for. I don't think it has been. And uh, an Admiralty House did one there a few years ago, around the time of the anniversary of the Florizel. So you can see that one if you're interested in Newfoundland ones that you know you can compare or whatever. Right? So, um, all right, Brenda, I'm gonna give you the book yeah. now. Yeah. All right. Okay, I don't want to remove you from the whole thing. I want to just stop you from being a panelist. I don't know if I can do that, Brenda. Do you want to just stop your video and I can mute you or something? Yeah. All right, here we go. And uh, Craig got a question here in the chat. Doesn't have a mic, so he typed it in. Um, Craig Westcott from the Shoreline is wondering about the timeline of the project uh, for completion. And just answer that with Brenda. And is 15 grand enough to cover the work? Uh, I believe so, yes. Uh, yes, I believe it is enough to cover the work. Um, again, as I said in the early part, we're lucky that we have some really great tech at the museum. So we didn't have to spend some money. We didn't just have to spend so much money on that. Um, and um, yeah, of course, a lot of the costs are going to go towards French translation. Uh, and of course, the, the cost of that would vary based on the word count that we eventually come up with. But uh, yeah. 15 grand is definitely a healthy budget to do something like this. And I think we will be within that budget for sure. 
Do you guys agree, Danita, Christina, all good? I feel like that's a satisfactory answer for that one. Um, thanks for your question, Craig. I'm going to lower Pat Sand and lower. So um, don't know if, if anyone else has a question here now, guys. Now's the time to answer it or ask it, sorry. Um, because see Jane Lynch here, and I've, I find it very hard to see Jane not ask a question or speak. I don't know. Jane, do you want to speak at anything? I can, I can allow you to talk if you want. Just got to raise your hand. No. Okay. Don't put her under pressure. She's got to do some tech lessons. Oh, Patrick is raising his hand here again. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I certainly can. Well, I'd like to say a few words about my next book. I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't got a big enough audience, Matthew. No, anyway, exactly, exactly. I just say, though, I mean, you know, something like this is really good for us because, I mean, Harbor Grace, you know, this area and, and the museum because, you know, it certainly the museum is a jewel in, in our town. Uh, it's underutilized as a tourism site. It always has been. I'm not laying blame here. It's just, it's just happened that way. So something like this could really, really spark, you know, really make the, this, this, uh, whole, this whole airfield itself as it's up there now in our history, the museum and the airfield in combination, and maybe sometime, please God, an, an interpretation center of transportation between the airfield and the coil. And I'm not, I'm not getting off the title now, topic, but from the point of view of being a hibernation and, and looking at that airfield in there and standing on top of Crow Hill, like he thinking, my God, what a spot we have here for, you know, for, you know, for people to come and have a look at it and celebrate. So something like this is, you know, other than the technical part of what you guys are doing, which is fabulous, I think is a great, great opportunity uh, here for not just the museum, and, but the town and the region, you know. So my goodness, I, I really get excited when I saw those pictures. Of course, I saw a lot of them elsewhere over the years in the museum, but putting it, putting it in this context, it, it, excites, it excites people who have been around this whole heritage business. So again, uh, con congratulations and uh, I wish you well. And with, as Brenda had said, uh, we're there for you on, on uh, help you out, whatever we can do to support you guys. Well, I think you're right. I mean, I think that it's, it's a great promotional tool for sure. And, um, you know, like I said, uh, as I should have mentioned earlier, you know, uh, you know, if the, if the virtual exhibit can pair with the, the physical exhibit at the museum, hopefully it can be a threefold thing where, it, you know, it attracts people to go into the airship itself. And maybe one of these days, the, you know, the accessibility and, interpretive issues there will be will be fixed and um uh will certainly uh i'm sure i'm sure this this project will be a, uh will be a significant step to again um revitalizing that area aviation story in, in a small way or a big way you will see and the book piece like you said pat you know that might be another avenue is the physical medium through 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 a text it might be might be another option one of these days too and i think it might be this might be a good to get the can for that or first step maybe who knows so all right i'm gonna remove you there now patrick all right last call for last call anyone with a question no i think we're good any final thoughts christina or danita on this one or you want to stick a pin in it for tonight no other than just to say it going to be a great project to work on. It's going to be more exciting when we get the opportunity to launch it. And I'm sure we'll have lots of people cheering us on and get that done. Any final thoughts, Ms. Power? Agreed. Thank you very much, Matthew. You did an awesome job. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll be signing off. It's eight after, uh, 20 after 8, so I think that's time enough. And we don't have any further questions. And um, anyone wants to chat about the project you can just email i guess the general email of the museum conception bay museum at outlook.com uh, i believe and uh or send us a message on facebook or something and we'll do our best to answer it 
Uh, all right, so signing off for tonight, guys. And um, just end it here. All right, Danita, all right, Christina, see you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All righty.